Chapter 4 The Youth of Duke William 1. The Birth and Accession of Duke William We have already spoken of Duke Robert, and how he tried to bring back his cousins the Athelings to England. Towards the end of his reign, Duke Robert determined to go on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, to pray at the tomb of Christ, and win the forgiveness of his sins. Before he went, he wished to settle the succession to his duchy, in case he should die on so long and dangerous a journey. He had no lawful children, and it was not at all clear who among his kinsfolk had the best right to succeed him. So after some difficulty, he was able to persuade the wise men of Normandy to accept as their future duke his little son William, who, as his parents had never been married, was called William the Bastard, till he had won a right to be called William the Conqueror and William the Great. William was born before his father became duke, while he was only count of the land of Hyesma, of which Falaise, the town of the rocks, was the capital, where Count Robert had a castle. There is a famous castle there still, but it is somewhat later than William's time, and he certainly was not born in it. But there is no doubt that William was born at Falaise, and that his mother, Herleva, was the daughter of a tanner of that town, whom Robert afterwards made his chamberlain. Herleva had also a daughter Adelaide by Duke Robert, and after his death she married a knight named Herlwyn of Conteville, to whom she bore two sons, Odo and Robert, William's half-brothers, who play a great part in our story. William was not at all ashamed, of the lowliness of his birth on the mother's side, and when he was duke, he raised her sons to high honor. As he was not Duke Robert's lawful son, he had no right to succeed according to modern law, but the rules of succession were then not at all fixed, and the Normans, above all, thought but little of lawful marriage and birth in such matters. The chief objection to William's being acknowledged as the future duke, was that he was a mere child, about seven years old, so that if his father died while he was away, he would not be able to govern. But Duke Robert said, He is little, but he will grow. And at last the wise men of Normandy swear to him. Then Robert went on his pilgrimage and never came back. He died on his way home in 1035 a long way from his own land, at Nicaea in Asia, where the famous council of the church was held in the days of Constantine, and was buried there. 2. William's Childhood It was after William became duke, but before he was a full-grown man, that the atheling, Alfred, had come to his sad end in England, and that the atheling, Edward, had been chosen king there. We cannot say how much William had personally to do with either matter. He came to his duchy as a child. But his childhood and youth were of a kind which made him a man, and a strong and wise man, very early. The Norman nobles were very hard to govern at any time, and when the prince was a child, they did whatever they chose. They were always fighting with one another, and sometimes murdering one another by craft, and they were always rebelling against their young duke, and sometimes seeking his life. For it must be remembered that they had not at all wished to have Herleva's son for their lord, and there were several kinsmen of Duke Robert, who thought, and rightly according to our notions, that they had a better right to the duchy than William. The young duke had good and faithful guardians, but several of them were murdered. The land, in short, was in a state of utter confusion. And now that Normandy was divided and weak, the old friendship with France began to give way, and the French and their kings began again to remember 
that the settlement of the Normans had cut off France from the sea. So Henry, the king of the French, joined himself to William's other enemies, and took his castle of Tellieres on the French border. Thus he was William's enemy early in his reign, and he became his enemy again afterwards. But in the most dangerous moment of William's Norman reign, the French king was his firm friend. This was in 1047, when a large part of Normandy rose in rebellion against William, of which we must say a little more. 3. The Revolt of Western Normandy It will be remembered that the western part of Normandy, the lands of Baix and Coutances, were won by the Norman dukes after the eastern part, the lands of Rouen and Evro. And it will be remembered that these western lands, won more lately and fed by new colonies from the north, were still heathen and Danish some while after eastern Normandy had become Christian and French-speaking. Now we may be sure that long before William's day all Normandy was Christian, but it is quite possible that the old tongue may have lingered on in the western lands. At any rate, there was a wide difference in spirit and feeling between the more French and the more Danish districts, to say nothing of Baix, where, before the Normans came, there had been a Saxon settlement. One part of the duchy, in short, was altogether romance in speech and manners, while more or less of Teutonic character still clave to the other. So now, Teutonic Normandy rose against Duke William, and Romance Normandy was faithful to him. The nobles of the Bessin and Cotentin made league with William's cousin, Guy of Burgundy, meaning, as far as one can see, to make Guy Duke of Rouen and Evro, and to have no lord at all for themselves. Their leader was Neil, the Viscount of the Cotentin, the son of the Neil who had beaten back the English invasion in Athelred's day. When the rebellion broke out, William was among them at Valone, and they tried to seize him. But his fool warned him in the night. He rode for his life, and got safe to his own fillets. 4. The Battle of val es Dunes. All eastern Normandy was loyal, but William doubted whether he could by himself overcome so strong an array of rebels. So he went to Poissy, between Rouen and Paris, and asked his lord, King Henry, to help him. So King Henry came, with a French army and the French, and those whom we may call the French Normans, met the Teutonic Normans in battle at val es dunes not very far from Caen. It was William's first pitched battle, a battle of horsemen, in which king and duke fought hand to hand against the rebels, and each slew some of their chief men. Yet King Henry was once thrown from his horse by a spear from the Cotentin, a deed of which the men of the peninsula sang in their rhymes. But they were beaten none the less, and the whole land which had rebelled submitted. Neil escaped, and was after a while pardoned, nor was Duke William's hand at all heavy on his vanquished enemies. But he had vanquished them thoroughly. He was now fully master of his own duchy, the Battle of val es dunes finally fixed that Normandy should take its character from Romance Rouen and not from Teutonic Baix. William had in short overcome Saxons and Danes in Gaul before he came to overcome them in Britain. He had to conquer his own Normandy before he could conquer England, and we shall see that between these two conquests he had in some sort to conquer France also. 5. Duke William's Visit to King Edward Thus Duke William was for the first time master in Normandy, and four years later it was no doubt said that King Edward was for the first time master in England. Godwine was gone, 
and the king's Norman favorites had everything their own way. And now the young duke came to pay his cousin a visit. With so many Normans at the court, and in other parts of the land, it might almost seem to him that he was still in his own duchy. Was it now that the thought first came into his head that he might succeed his childless kinsman in a kingdom which looked as if it had already become Norman? Certain it is that William always said that Edward had promised him the crown at his death, and this visit seems a more likely time for such a promise than any time before or after. Of course we must remember that Edward could not, by English law, really leave William the crown. The utmost that he could do would be to recommend the wise men to choose him at his death. But just at this time, neither William nor Edward was likely to think much about English law, and Edward's Norman counselors were still less likely to think about it than either of them. We cannot say for certain how it was, but we can hardly doubt that Edward did make William some kind of promise, and this seems the most likely time for it. At any rate, William had now conquered Normandy and had visited England. These are two steps towards the time when he again came to England, not as guest, but as conqueror. 6. Duke William in his own duchy. We shall see presently that the course of events in England must have altogether thrown back William's hopes with regard to the English crown. But he went on winning fame and power in his own land beyond the sea. He ruled his duchy wisely and well, and it flourished greatly under him. He promoted learned men from other countries, above all, two men who lived to play a greater part in England than in Normandy. These were Lanfrac from Pavia in Italy, and Anselm from Aosta in Burgundy. They were both monks of the newly founded monastery of Beck in Normandy, which was at this time a nursery of famous men. The duke married Matilda, daughter of Baldwin Count of Flanders, by whom he had several daughters, and for the present, three sons, Robert, Richard, and William. The most famous of his daughters was Adela, who married Stephen, Count of Blois. But Duke William did not reign without rebellions at home and wars abroad. For a short time after the Battle of Val es Dunes, the friendship between the Duke and King Henry of France went on. Both joined in a war against Geoffrey, Count of Anjou, who now held the land of Maine, between Anjou and Normandy. In 1049, Duke William, for the first time, extended his dominions by winning the castles of Domfront and Ambriers in Maine, of which Domfront has ever since been part of Normandy. But before long, King Henry got jealous of William's power, and he was now always ready to give help to any Norman rebels. Men in France began again to say that Normandy was a land cut off from France, and that France should be made again to reach to the sea, as of old. And the other neighboring princes were jealous of him, as well as the king. His neighbors in Brittany, Anjou, Chartres, and Poitou were all against him, but the great duke was able to hold his own against them all, and before long, to make a great addition to his dominions. 7. Duke William's Wars with France The wars between Normandy and France were very important, because they have so great a bearing on English history. There was no quarrel between England and France, as long as Normandy lay between them but France and Normandy had many quarrels and wars. So when the same prince ruled England and in Normandy, England was dragged into the quarrels of Normandy, and there grew up a rivalry between England and France which went on after Normandy was conquered by France. These wars, therefore, between Duke William and King Henry 
are really the beginning of the long wars between England and France. King Henry invaded Normandy three times. The first, in 1053, the king came to help a kinsman of the duke's, William Count of Arx, near Dieppe, where the castle with a very deep ditch is still to be seen. This time the French army was caught in an ambush and was utterly routed. In this battle was killed Ingleram, Count of Poitou, which made room for the accession of his brother, Count Guy. The next year, 1054, King Henry came again with a much greater army, gathered from his own kingdom and from the dominions of many of the other princes of Gaul. They came in two great divisions to attack Normandy on both sides of the Seine. That which came in on the right bank was utterly cut to pieces in the town of Mortimer, which they had occupied, and where the Normans attacked them by night. Then the duke sent a messenger, who crossed to the other side of the river, where the king's own army was, where he climbed a tree and shouted to them in the darkness, to go bury their friends who were dead at Mortimer. So they were seized with a panic and fled. In this battle, the new Count of Poitou, Guy, was taken prisoner, and was not let go till he became Duke William's man for his county. Peace was now made with France, and Duke William was allowed to make some conquests at the expense of Anjou. But very soon, France and Anjou were again allied against Normandy. In 1058, King Henry made his last invasion. This time, the French army was cut off by a sudden attack at the fort of Vereville, near the Dive. All these campaigns show that William, who could fight so well in a pitched battle, was no less skillful in all kinds of cunning enterprises. Soon after this, in 1060, both King Henry and Geoffrey of Anjou died. William was now safe from all attacks on that side, all the more so as the new king of the French, Philip, was a child, and the regent was William's own father-in-law, Count Baldwin of Flanders. 8. The Conquest of Maine Thus William, who in some sort conquered his own Normandy at Valles Dunes, did in some sort also conquer France at Mortimer, and Vereville. But he had not yet enlarged his dominions, except at Domfront and Ambriers, and one or two other points on the frontier towards Maine. He was presently able to win the whole county. And this part of William's life should be carefully studied, because his conquest of Maine is strikingly like his conquest of England. In both cases, he won a land against the will of its people, and yet with some show of legal right. Maine had had counts of its own, some of them famous men, as were also many of the bishops of the great city of Le Mans. The citizens, too, were stout and jealous of their freedom. But latterly, the land of Maine had come under the power of Geoffrey of Anjou. On Geoffrey's death, the lawful Count Herbert, to get back his county, commended himself to William, and they settled that William's son Robert should marry Herbert's sister Margaret, and that Maine should pass to their descendants. This was something like Edward's promise of the English crown to William. In 1063, Herbert died childless, and William claimed the county on behalf of his son though he and Margaret were not yet married. But the people of Maine chose for their count, Walter, Count of Mont, who had married Count Herbert's aunt Biota. He was the son of King Edward's sister, Godgifu, and brother of Ralph of Hereford. This was like the English people choosing Harold. Then William made war on Maine, and occupied the county bit by bit, till the city surrendered, and Walter submitted to him. Soon after this, Walter and Biota died. William's enemies said that he poisoned them, which is not in the least likely. 
but from this time he ruled over Maine as well as over Normandy. We shall see that its brave people revolted more than once against both him and his sons. But the conquest of Maine raised William's power and fame to a higher pitch than it reached at any other time before his conquest of England. And soon after the conquest of Maine, the affairs of Normandy and England, which have stayed apart ever since William's visit to Edward, begin to be joined together. It is time, then, to go back and see what had been happening meanwhile in England.